Thank you all for coming out today. Um, Menachem and I were neighbors in the corridor. We had offices next to each other for about 20 years and have collaborated on some papers. And he was the driving force behind getting me to come to the conference here today. And I'm very pleased to be back in Israel. It's my second trip. And the topic we're going to talk about um, is extremely timely. I mean, since I agreed to come, the markets, the values of these assets have gone totally out of control. The topic, I think, is even more interesting than it was when the conference was first organized. And there are far more questions here than answers, but I want to raise some issues that I think have been overlooked by some of the other speakers. And in particular, I want to focus the discussion away from Bitcoin and look at some of the other cryptocurrencies, which are, I think, very quickly becoming much more important and um, greatly increasing the complexity of the job of the regulator, the investor, and other groups. So let's start, and if somebody could take the lights down, I think it would be very helpful for people to see. Um, yeah, great, thank you. Um, let me just lay the groundwork for this by talking about where Bitcoin came from and how it's grown and so forth, but I quickly want to move off the topic and talk about other things. So Bitcoin is a payment system. You might call it a currency, but it's very different from other forms of money that we've seen in economic history. In particular, it is stateless, so there's no government behind it. And you don't have an authority, it's completely decentralized. So there's no board of governors, there's no mint or central bank. And the governance of this thing is completely from the bottom up by a very unusual form of democracy. And the way that transactions get entered into the ledger is through a process called consensus, where cryptography and mathematical proofs are used to authenticate the spending of the bitcoins. Now, this is very much common to all of the cryptocurrencies. This is um, a paradigm that was introduced by Bitcoin, but by and large, most of the 1,300 cryptocurrencies share these properties, that they're not organized by a government, there typically is no leader or central authority, and there's a huge reliance on decentralized cryptography as the means for making it work. Bitcoin is really a computer network, and this is a recent screenshot of where the nodes are around the world that relay the traffic. So you see that there's a huge concentration in the eastern US and western Europe. Um, Israel would be right about here. There's other parts of the world, though, where the network barely operates at all. And I think there's a close correlation between the presence of human capital and the interest in this and the likelihood that you'll find a concentration of Bitcoin nodes. Even though a lot of the demand for this is in China, you don't see so much of the network actually being physically present in China. I think this picture also gives you an idea of the problem that the regulator has. That if in any one country a regulator decides that this is dangerous or that this needs to be somehow enforced against, there's not a lot you can really do about it. You know, the Israeli regulator could maybe shut down these machines here, but will that really disrupt the network? Um, this thing was designed to be beyond the reach of regulators. It's a very subversive technology. It knows no borders. It really is not subject to any kind of enforcement. You can go to court and get some kind of injunction against Bitcoin, but where do you take that injunction to get it enforced? You know, there's no Bitcoin sheriff, there's no person in charge of it. Um, this is really quite threatening to financial regulation as we know it now, and I think many regulators are still in denial about this and beginning to come to grips with the fact that it's really designed to put them out of business. Now, the values of Bitcoin, I've tabulated just three numbers here. The, the first one in October of 2009 was the very first exchange rate that was established for Bitcoin, which was about 1300 to the US dollar. And then the first Bitcoin exchanges began to operate in 2010, and you could buy them for about five cents each. Recently, the price has been around 15 or 16,000. Know, just incredible rates of appreciation that if you had bought this at any time in the past, even two or three months ago, your rate of return has been rather astonishing. 
Now, for some of the other cryptocurrencies, such as Ethereum, that I'm going to talk about, the rates of return have been even bigger. Um, some of these make Bitcoin look cheap and uninteresting in terms of what you might have made as an investor. Now, I got interested in this really for political reasons. Um, I had read years ago in high school a novel called The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pinchon. And it was about a group that started a subversive post office that competed with the government's post office in secret. And I began to read about Bitcoin in the press and I saw stories like this. This is a couple in 2013, five years ago, who went on a honeymoon and lived for more than 100 days only on Bitcoin. So all of their food, travel, lodging and so forth was paid for in this alternative financial world. So even five years ago, there was enough infrastructure in place that you could lead your life off the grid and avoid the scrutiny of the government. You could also avoid taxes and money laundering and things like that. But what these people had created was a system that was extremely subversive and that it was designed to really undermine the government's authority over the economy. And I found this interesting. Um, I wasn't necessarily in favor of this, but I wasn't against it either. I thought that this would be a challenge. So I began to read about this and lecture about it. And my colleagues at first thought I had totally lost my mind, you know, to, to spend time on a topic like this. Um, within about six months, I found myself in Basel at the Bank for International Settlements at a meeting that was never publicly announced with the heads of all the central banks, sitting in a room in a round table with about 40 of them, and they knew all about this. So this was Janet Yellen, Mario Draghi, and so forth, and me. And we were there to talk about Bitcoin and the challenges it posed to central banks. And you know, from the earliest days, the people at the top of the financial system understood the threat that this posed. You know, the fact that it crossed borders, that it used a technology that was completely unreachable and barely understood by the regulators. And I think today this problem is much, much greater from their point of view. Now, the value of these things has soared, especially in the last year. That if you look at the market value of all the cryptocurrencies, it's heading in the direction of about a trillion dollars. This, this was just yesterday, it was about 778 billion. And as you see, much of the appreciation is really in the last 12 months or so. And what's interesting to me is the proliferation of the other currencies. And this is really what I want to talk about. Um, these are sometimes called altcoins because they are alternatives to Bitcoin. There's roughly 1,300 of them. More of them are being created every week. And the barriers to entry here are almost non-existent. In fact, I've been at other academic conferences where the university sponsoring the conference introduced its own coin as part of the conference. So, you know, we could be doing Ono coin today. I mean, you know, maybe it, all it takes is booting up some software and, um, you know, designing a few parameters. But what you really need to do, of course, is persuade people to use it. And at least some of these folks have been pretty good at this. And I think the most important statistic is really this, and I think some of the other speakers have already alluded to this. A year ago, almost 90% of the value in this market was from one currency, which was Bitcoin. You know, really, if you wanted to talk about cryptocurrency, you could talk about Bitcoin, and that would be sufficient to more or less cover the entire ground. Today, it's about a third. And many of these others have come up in value and gained a presence in the market. And I think a year from now, it's quite likely that Bitcoin will be dropping behind. You know, it's really a fairly primitive currency compared to some of the others. And the capabilities and versatility of, of many of the newer ones are really pretty impressive. And I wanna focus on a few of them. So here's a ranking and a good website that keeps track of this and is very widely used is called coinmarketcap.com. So I tend to check in at this point several times a day at this website. And you see that Bitcoin is still the largest with a market cap, this is as of yesterday, of 267 billion, which makes it worth more than almost every public company listed on stock markets around the world. 
but there are 43 of them now that are worth at least a billion. And that's, in fact, more than I can keep track of myself. And some of the others, you've got Ethereum and Ripple, both of which I want to talk about in some detail, are now north of 100 billion each. And many other interesting ones, um, again, too numerous to talk about in this, in this lecture, but a lot of these are very intentionally differentiated for particular uses, or they have features that others don't. And I think we're moving very rapidly into a world where there is a lot of customization of currency, where you're having currency for particular goods and services or particular geographic locations. Um, some currency is focused very much on privacy and secrecy. This forces us to reconsider, first of all, what is the definition of money? I think we've all grown up with a very simple idea that money is a medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account. Um, many of these things do one or more of these, some, but some are overlooked. And I think you know, it's a real question almost of philosophy about what do we mean by money. But the nature of money is, I think, very different in the cryptographic world than we're typically brought up to thought of. And, and this is, for a professor, very interesting, but for the regulator, very challenging. And I think what you're seeing here above all is something that is wonderful for people who are entrepreneurs because there's the ability to jump into this market. The barriers to entry are almost non-existent. And you can design new custom currencies that have very targeted uses. And if you can find a market for these, there's really the opportunity to meet needs in society better than they've been met in the past and also get very rich for yourself. So one word of caution, and when we talk about these market capitalizations, and let's just look at Bitcoin. When you, we say Bitcoin is worth $267 billion, they're doing the very simple calculation of the market price of the marginal coin, which is the most recent trade. So in this case, $15,915. <clears throat> and then they're multiplying this by the supply of Bitcoins that have been issued. This makes the point in great detail that the way that the supply is calculated is quite different from one coin to another. Some of these things are in escrow, some are reserved by the founders, but the liquidity in these markets is not particularly high. You could not go out and sell many bitcoins for $15,000. And to claim that the marginal price of the most recent trade of 15000 is the average price of all the bitcoins, I think is pretty fanciful. We also do this with companies on the stock market. We can look at the price of one share of IBM and then multiply that price by all the shares and claim that IBM has a market cap of X. But what's rarely true is that the market has enough liquidity and depth to absorb that much supply. So I think it's, it's worth realizing that these numbers are fanciful, that they're based on sometimes very aggressive assumptions about the price you could get for large trades and so forth. But nevertheless, for a technology that didn't even exist nine years ago, it's very impressive how quickly this has grown and what people are prepared to pay for this in the markets today. So one thing you can do with this is look at when cryptocurrency trades, what do people trade it for? And one thing that I've been very suspicious about is whether this is just an internal system where people trade one crypto for another, trade Ethereum for Litecoin, Litecoin for Bitcoin, and it has a flavor of a board game, you know, like a game of Monopoly, but it's really not connected to the real economy. So I've assigned this to some students as homework, and this is one particular student who did a very good job on it. She, she tabulated that for all the Bitcoin trading, and this was just on one day last July, about two-thirds of Bitcoin was simply traded for other cryptos. But a lot of it was traded for US dollars or Russian rubles, Chinese you know, euro and so forth, Japanese yen. And you can look at the others and more or less the same thing, that Ethereum is traded about one quarter for other cryptos, but a lot of it is for fiat currency. So I don't think this stuff is unconnected at all to the real financial system. In fact, if you aggregate it all together, all the cryptocurrency, only about a third of it is crypto for crypto, 
but about two thirds of it seems to be essentially investment speculation where people are trading these things for essentially Chinese, US, uh, South Korea is really big in this. I think a lot of the Korean volume is simply Chinese volume that is migrating over the border to evade capital controls and so forth down the rankings. Very recently, Japan has shot up and become a huge source of volume. And I think, again, this is really shadow volume from China that is involved in capital flight. So if you look at all these cryptos, the commonality between them is that almost all of them rely on blockchains as the ledger to keep track of them. And almost all of them, in fact, every single one has no connection to a sovereign government, that these are all issued by entrepreneurs and they all are meant to cross borders and be really globally marketed. And what's fun about them is that none of them are physical in their form and that you can't actually hold them. They're just all imaginary. They are bits and bytes in computer memory. It's been said by some people that Bitcoin is the greatest practical joke of all time. You know, somebody says there's something really valuable, you just can't see it, and it's called a Bitcoin. And pretty soon people are teaching university courses about it and organizing conferences and investing money in it, but nobody ever actually gets to see it. But I think this speaks to the reliance that we all have on computers and our willingness to take computer code as something very valuable. So when we talk about having futures and derivative contracts on Bitcoin on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which, which now exists as of a month ago, the fact that they are virtual in form is really not a, a problem for anybody to get their mind around. But the differences between them, I think, are really the interesting point. And you know, a couple things that are easy to identify to, to set one apart from the other is that first of all, many of them have very different intended uses. Bitcoin is actually meant to be a general purpose currency that you in principle could spend for anything, for food, for clothing, for university tuition, for anything that you wish. But some of the others are targeted very narrowly at one product or service or maybe at one marketplace. Um, such as a country or a region of the world. The way that they are distributed is quite different. Some of these are auctioned off and the initial coin offerings that we've heard a lot about and they've become very popular in the last year would be examples of this. Others are just given to people by means of something called an airdrop where you just decide who your user base is or who you would like it to be and just allocate units of currency to them. Um, sometimes there is a founder who dribbles them out as rewards to people and so forth. But in terms of designing a currency, this is an interesting problem for research and for economists to think about. It turns out that there's a number of ways to get these things into circulation and to stimulate demand and liquidity in the marketplace. And then in the background, there's always a process called typically mining where people are updating the ledger hour by hour, day by day, as the coins are used. And typically, there's an incentive system to entice the miners to participate. These are very, very different in the infrastructure of the currency, how, how miners are motivated and attracted to take place in these, in these markets. And again, the success and the traction that these currencies are able to get in the marketplace, I think, has a lot to do with how well the mining system is is put in place or not. And then finally, this is, I think in the last year or two, probably the most interesting trend. The blockchain itself is extremely transparent. And one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is that you can really look at everybody else's ownership and spending behavior. You can see the economic activity of your neighbors and your competitors. Some people don't like this. They like money to be private. They don't want their financial affairs to be laid bare before the government, before you know, their neighbors and so forth. So we're increasingly seeing coins that operate on blockchains, but with a degree of secrecy and privacy that were not there in the early stages of this. So let me skip ahead and now and talk about a couple of these in great detail. And I think the, the obvious one to turn to first would be Ethereum, which has been, for the past couple of years, the strong number two in approaching Bitcoin very rapidly in value. Now, Ethereum was created by a 19-year-old kid 
named Vitalik Buterin, and this is a picture of him. I think that this guy is probably the most important person in worldwide finance today and I'm very comfortable making this statement. You will hear more and more about him. What he has created is extremely clever. So Ethereum is a blockchain that permits contingent instructions. So Bitcoin, I can send Bitcoins from Alice to Bob. On Ethereum, I can put conditions on that. I can say, send the Bitcoins from Alice to Bob if the temperature is above 30 degrees centigrade or if my flight is late, or if Bob first makes payments on his debt to Charlie. In other words, I can make these contingent instructions. Ethereum is intended to be a platform for smart contracts, where people have a commercial relationship, you take the contract and reduce it to a series of computer instructions that represent the reciprocal promises of both parties, and then the code just executes itself based on the programming. Now, a lot can go wrong here, and a lot already has, but the potential is enormous. The entire insurance industry can pretty much be replicated in smart contracts, and people are already working on this. A lot of the debt markets, things like the use of collateral, restrictive covenants, and so forth, can be put onto this platform. And you know, there's much more to be learned about Ethereum. We could go on for hours and hours, you know, lecturing about this, and in fact, I do in my course back in New York. But suffice it to say that the transaction volume has grown very, very quickly. This is um, how many transactions are made every day for Bitcoin, and for a long time, Bitcoin was almost the whole market. But look at how Ethereum, which is the blue one, has begun to grow. And in particular, in the third quarter of 2013, the number of Ethereum transactions overtook Bitcoin. And I think this is really where your attention should be. Bitcoin will increasingly be of historical interest. I think it started something big and it provides a useful reference point, but Ethereum is a much more versatile platform and the capabilities of it are extremely interesting. So I think the regulators are still trying to understand Bitcoin, but they're like, that's like watching last season's TV. You know, this is, the, the, the market has moved on. And this is really where the interesting stuff is. Now, it's not to say that some kid who's today 12 years old won't come along with something better. In fact, the, the history of technology is that the half-life of these things is about 18 months. And if I go back to this ranking for a second, this thing called Cardano here, and if anyone in the room knows anything about it, I would be impressed, but Cardano is supposed to be something that out Ethereum's Ethereum. Like it's a much better version. I mean, we'll wait and see, but a year from now, that may be the one that we're all talking about. But this thing's growing really quickly, and I think the big innovation that they've had is that all of the ICOs pretty much are placed on the Ethereum blockchain. So if you want to start one of these token sales and create a, a coin that is customized to your company, Ethereum provides a type of code called ERC20 that you can just kind of take off the shelf and just adjust your parameters. How many coins, how quickly do we want to issue them and so forth. And what a lot of this volume has been over the last year is people issuing the ICOs. So Buterin has set himself up essentially as the host for other people's money. And, you know, in other words, he is kind of doing what banks used to do in the past. Now, is this something for the banking regulator to deal with? You know, maybe, but frankly, I think most banking regulators around the world have not even heard of Ethereum, and you know, far fewer of them actually understand it. But this is a very bright guy, and he has been able to create something that's today worth $120 billion. I think he owns about 10% of it in coins that he reserved to himself. And this really is the the ecosystem or the infrastructure that's being used by many other entrepreneurs to bring their coins to market. So I think this is really very important and it's much more ambitious and creative than Bitcoin. Ripple is the number three and Ripple, 
when students have asked me, I hate to give investment advice to students, but when they really press me and they ask, you know, which of these things has the most long-term potential, Ripple has been a favorite of mine because there's a clear business usage for Ripple. Ripple has existed as far back as 2004, which is four years longer than Bitcoin. And it's a system that is actually based on trust, where you stipulate that you trust somebody. So I would say I trust Menachem because we've been colleagues for 24 years and you know, we've traveled around the world. You know, it's a long relationship. And then there are people in the room who I don't know, but he does. And so he could be an intermediary to pass funds from A to B to C. So what Ripple does is chain people together who transitively trust each other by stipulation. And rather than cryptography, they really rely on what they call gateways of trust. They also have a token called the Ripple token, which can be used as a substitute for these relationships. Now, it's a little bit of a weird technology, but they finally hit on a use for it, which was to get the major banks to adopt Ripple as a means of international money transfer. So here's a news story. They have a company called Google who they're working with. And what they're trying to do is basically displace the SWIFT network as a corridor for cross-border payments. This is working out really well because the SWIFT network is a disaster. Um, one of the earlier speakers referred to the Bangladesh Central Bank losing $81 million last year that they thought the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was holding for them. But the SWIFT network takes, even to send money from Tel Aviv to New York, would take about four days, 7% fee for a very credit worthy customer. Ripple can do this almost for free and they can do it in a matter of minutes. So Ripple is making big inroads in the international remittances market. And this market is vast. Many of the major banks are now clients and they're not trying to replicate transfers among all 200 countries. They're just going for the high volume corridors like London to New York, you know, Tokyo to Montreal, whatever. Um, they'll let the small transfers from Namibia to Mexico City stay on the SWIFT network. This is very dangerous for the banks. And I think what you're increasingly going to see are cryptographic assets that are targeted at the high margin businesses of the banks, and they will strip them off one by one till the banks are left with the transactions that nobody else wishes to do. Um, Ripple is really attracting a lot of admiration and high profile investors. And it's worth $102 billion. And it's, you know, essentially, even though it's a very general platform, it's concentrated all of its, all of its resources on this one use case, which is international remittances. Um, I think if you come back in five years, either the SWIFT network will be gone entirely or what's more likely is the SWIFT network will have to modernize itself and put itself on a blockchain, probably other people will enter the remittances businesses as well. This will be great for customers. It will be great for the sponsors of these currencies. It will be very bad for the banks who are going to lose a high margin business where they get the free float for the currencies. And I'm not sure there's much that the regulators can do about this other than sit on the sidelines and watch. In fact, this is a case where private entrepreneurs are solving a problem that the regulators have very obviously failed at. The international remittance system is a disaster. It's costly. It's unreliable. It goes across borders, which means that no one regulator has been able to handle it. And what you have here is a private solution that seems to be doing a much, much better job. So of all the valuations that you see in the crypto world, this is the one that maybe makes the most sense to me because this is a massive business that most of the world depends on and Ripple appears to have very ingeniously created a good solution to it. Now, a couple others and I will be a little more brief. Litecoin is a clone of Bitcoin. It's, it's identical to Bitcoin in almost every respect except it's meant to be quicker for the customer. So Bitcoin's blocks are created every 10 minutes. And that means that if you walk into a store and try to spend a Bitcoin, it actually won't be verified 
for, you know, the median time would be five minutes if you're halfway through the next block. But you may have to stand at the register for a period of time or they will just have to take it on faith that you're not going to run down the street and spend that Bitcoin again at the shop next door. Now, Litecoin's blocks come four times faster. They're two and a half minutes instead of 10 minutes. And Litecoin is also designed in a way that the mining is simpler and it doesn't admit to the brute force processing power of thousands of machines. So it's meant to be more democratic and more accessible to people. Um, I'm not sure that these differences are enough to make Litecoin successful in the long run, but the thing is worth $14 billion. And this is you know, really with some, a couple of basic design tweaks versus Bitcoin. And you know, I, th I think it's interesting that this is something sorted out by the market, and these are a couple of design parameters, the block cycle time, for instance, being a particularly important one. On the Ethereum blockchain, the blocks come at five per minute. So every 12 seconds, there's a new block on Ethereum. And I think if I were designing a currency, I would be thinking along those terms. But Litecoin is simply really an attempt by entrepreneurs to show that there's probably a better way to do some of the things that were hard-coded into Bitcoin. And um, it has found enough of an audience to be worth $14 billion. Now, the privacy coins, and I want to mention two of them, I think are in many ways the most interesting and the most dangerous to governments and so forth. So the first of these showed up just over a year ago. This was in November of 2016, and there's an entrepreneur named Zuko Wilcox who created Zcash. And what Zcash does is operate on a blockchain, so the payments are on a blockchain, but it anonymizes the name of the sender, the recipient, and the amount. Now, a lot of people have misunderstood the transparency of blockchains. And in particular, the early days of Bitcoin were often connected to something called the Silk Road marketplace, where people could buy and sell drugs, and not just marijuana, but heroin and opioids and you know, all kinds of psychedelic things that are illegal everywhere. And this was thought to be kind of fun, but what I should, you know, if, if you don't understand this, the blockchain leaves a record forever of your spending. So if you happen to be on the Silk Road five years ago, if you ever had the idea to buy drugs on the Bitcoin blockchain, you're making a big mistake because the enforcement people have a record that is there forever. And even if they can't figure out today who you are, they will eventually. Zcash is different. Zcash hides who you are and how much you spent. And it uses a type of cryptography called a zero-knowledge proof. So I think for governments, one of the secrets about many of these blockchains is they actually welcome them because all the people trying to evade taxes and launder money leave footprints. Not with these privacy coins, though. And the one that seems to be more interesting than Zcash at the moment is Monero. Um, Monero, there's three or four of these privacy coins that are meant to operate in secret, and Monero has basically a method of proof that is viewed by people as even better than Zcash. Now, for the regulators, this is really where it gets ugly. And what I've found, at least in talking to people at conferences, is that they haven't been able to invert these. And, you know, you would think that maybe the people at the NSA could somehow invert this and figure out who really is putting the money on the blockchain and so forth. But at least up to now, these things seem to work. And they seem to provide cover to the gangsters and criminals and tax evaders that um, they really weren't ever able to get either from Bitcoin or other forms of money laundering. Now, I'm skeptical. You know, when the government tells me that it's impossible to invert this. You know, are they really being truthful or are they just laying a trap and trying to entice people? I, we won't really know the answer to this for many years. You know, if you saw the movie about the Enigma machine, as soon as they cracked the code, they kept it secret. They didn't go blurting it out. They waited till there was a real opportunity to use it. So I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but I know there's an awful lot of interest in this. 
But in the end, these things are valued not at 100 billion, but at like 6 billion each, you know, because I think the potential market and the reliance and trust upon these is not as high as it is for some of the others. Um, a couple others, and these are mostly for fun, there's something called Potcoin, and this is an example of something targeted at a particular product. This is a coin that was introduced with the intention that legal marijuana dispensaries would use it as the currency of choice. And it became well known because they hired a celebrity sponsor who was the eccentric basketball star Dennis Rodman, who was recruited to be the spokesperson for Potcoin. And here he is wearing a Potcoin t-shirt to visit North Korea. Um, this was a photo taken in the Pyongyang airport of all places where he's showing up to meet the great dictator Chairman Kim and the trip was paid for by Potcoin. Now, as a marketing device, this has worked rather well. And the thing is worth um, $65 million, which I think we would all be happy to have. Um, in the end, will this be adopted and used widely? I don't know, but there's enough people taking it seriously that you know, it's, it's got a value at least in the tens of millions. Here's a similar type of coin, which is called solar coin. This is meant to reward people who put solar panels on their roof. And if you generate one megawatt of electricity, you get one solar coin. And you just have to kind of sign up for it and they'll mail it to you. Now people trade these back and forth on the exchanges and solar coin at the moment is worth about $61 million. Um, and it's been distributed all over the world. It's, it's really meant to work like a frequent flyer rewards program or a loyalty program to motivate people to do something good for the environment. So I think the economics between Potcoin and SolarCoin are almost identical, that they're aimed at a certain user community. And whether these things are going to grow and get big enough to, to endure is anybody's guess. But given the large number of them that are targeted at specific markets of all kinds that are out there, you know, bicycle coin, basketball coin, whatever, I think at least some of these are going to get through and begin to become important in certain industries. Um, last one I want to mention is something called Aurora coin. And Aurora coin was targeted at one country, which was Iceland. This was an attempt to subvert the Icelandic banking system through a virtual currency that was issued privately and was meant to compete head to head with the Icelandic kroner. So the founder of this airdropped it by giving every Icelandic resident a certain allotment on a day in March of 2015, or 2014. So every Icelandic resident got 31.8 Aurora coins. And this was of concern to the political regulators in Iceland because, as everybody knows, their banking system collapsed and never really recovered after the financial crisis. And it's a country where you have intelligent people, all of them with computers who are probably prepared to accept a cryptocurrency. Um, suffice it to say that this thing wasn't particularly successful. It kind of died off within a couple of weeks after being introduced. But even today, it still trades with a market value of $17 million. This is kind of like a bankrupt company. You know, today you can still buy shares of Enron and Lehman Brothers because there's a thin chance that they would bounce back someday and become important again. And these cryptos never go away. Aurora coin is still out there. It's the 443rd most valuable. But I think what it tried to do is probably going to be duplicated by other people, that you could launch a currency for a country like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, where the banking system has basically failed. And what you're almost doing is going back to the era of free banking in the 19th century. These are not going to work most of the time, but a few of them actually might. And again, for the regulator, it adds a degree of freedom and complexity to the whole exercise that they're responsible for that is um, you know, making their job all the more difficult. So last point I want to make is that what lies behind all this is an infrastructure of people called miners. You know, I showed you that map of the Bitcoin network that goes all over the world. Many of those nodes are basically people like this who have warehouses full of specialized computers that are competing with each other to update the ledger and enter new transactions. There is great mistrust of these people. And 
what the regulators worry about is what if something goes wrong here? What if these people collude with each other? What if politicians in China nationalize these things? You know, all kinds of fanciful conspiracy theories. But what is going to happen almost surely is that as these markets grow, big companies are going to get into the mining business. That the ultimate miner of bitcoins is not some Chinese entrepreneur in a bunker in Mongolia. It's probably a cloud computing company like Amazon. And what you have seen in just the last couple months is some real companies begin to invest in this business. So in particular, there's a couple of Japanese media companies that very publicly announced that they're opening new divisions that are going to be focused on cryptocurrency mining. These things can switch. They don't mine just one currency. They, in fact, can switch from Bitcoin to Litecoin to Ethereum, hour to hour. Look at what the reward is, how many people are they competing against. And they are basically data centers, not unlike what the banks have. So I think what is evolving rather quickly is a whole infrastructure of a financial system that is outside the old financial system. And it's going to increasingly attract the technology companies, that your bank of the future, who's going to process all the traffic, is probably IBM, Amazon, and other cloud computing people like this. Because this has gotten big enough now that the money to be earned, if the market is worth 800 billion and the number of new coins a year is, say, 5% issuance, that's 40 billion in revenue to fight over, and that's enough to get the attention of the big companies on Wall Street. So, this is really where the regulators need to be looking at is, you know, when is Amazon going to enter this market? How will they behave? Um, my understanding is that the Israeli regulators would kick them off the stock exchange as punishment for having connections to this business, but good luck with that. I mean, this is exactly where the industry is headed, where many entrepreneurs will be developing new coins, but in the background, I think an infrastructure of computer companies, many of which we're already familiar with, are probably going to be processing and recording these technologies on blockchains. It's a very different banking system, but I think given the weaknesses and abuses and failures of the banking system that we already have, it's bound to be better for everybody in the long run. Okay, thank you all very much.